beautiful. Thank you. Should we give her a hand? <laughs> And it made Anne cry, so yeah, I guess it did its job. Welcome, everyone. My name is Susan Watson. I'm a celebrant here at Crisp Mortuary, and I'm really humbled to stand before you today to honor Gordon and tell a little bit of his story. You know, with everything that I am, I know that he's with us in spirit here today, as well as in body. And I know that because I know that our bodies eventually fail us, but our souls and spirits don't, and they go on. So I believe that Gordon is here with us in spirit. I, in fact, believe that he knows that each and every one of you are here. And I believe that he can feel all of the love and good intentions that everyone brings to this place. So thank you, as I can feel. I'd like to start with some gathering words to hold us together, to honor this generous man. And I speak these words to you from Gordon to start. When I come to the end of the day and the sun is set for me, I want no rights in a gloom-filled room. I cry for a soul set free. Miss me a little, but not too long, and not with your head bowed low. Remember the love that we once shared. Miss me, but let me go. For this is a journey we all must make, and we each must go alone. It's all a part of the Master's plan, a step on the road to home. So when you're lonely and sick at heart, go to these friends we know and bury your sorrow in doing good works. Miss me, let me go. Before I begin, take a moment for yourself. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath and clear your minds of the worries and the details of this day. Settle your heartbeats and focus all of your love and positive energy. I'm Gordon Richard Dryden the reason that we've all gathered in this place today. I don't know if you're aware, but I'm going to remind you now that this is a sacred moment. Sacred, first of all, because of Gordon's presence, but also sacred because you've come here today and you've brought a lot of intimate and personal memories of Gordon. We gather in sadness, a bit of shock, and in great love for this man who was so diligent, a determined man, quiet, talented, family-oriented, and one who added so much to our lives. He was a strong and steady presence for us, and his absence leaves a void that's impossible to fill. And because we all come with this void, we wanted to be with other people who feel the same way about Gordon. So we all put this day and time on our calendar and nothing was gonna interfere with our being with other like-minded people who loved Gordon and who wish him well today. I want you to remind you that this is the time and place to feel your feelings to their very fullest extent. And this bears testimony to the goodness of Gordon's life and the heroism that he showed during his life. I know that Gordon was devoted to his parents, Richard and Marie, and his sisters, Dolores and Carol Lee. He was a good son and brother all of his days. Dolores and Carol Lee survive him today. Gordon was dedicated and determined to make a good life for himself. So he was diligent, he worked very hard, and he often had more than one job as a young man, and eventually created a career that brought him great joy 
and great satisfaction. I know he was brave when he faced the ups and downs of life, and he tended to move forward from adversity without losing his joy in the simple things of this life. Anne told me he was a man of faith who believed in the goodness of God, in Christ Jesus, and in an everlasting life in heaven. He had great heart for his immediate family, Anne and Dave and Nancy, Matt and Ben, and I imagine he was happiest when he was in their midst. So, devotion, dedication, hard work, determination, courage, faith, and heart are all wonderfully heroic qualities that we can evermore associate with Gordon Dryden. And you know, when you think about it, some of those virtues can rub off on us because we spent time with him. And so we're better for having shared time with Gordon. And there's hope. And the, hope, the hopefulness comes when we know that we can carry the very best of Gordon with us as we go through our own lives. It's the very best of him, and it's, the, it's in the form of his legacy. When we share Gordon's legacy, he has a continued presence in our lives and in the world. He was very valuable on this earth, worked with his hands, was a kind man. And I'm going to ask his grandsons, Matt and Ben, to come forward. I have some votive candles here. I want them to light them. And they're over at this table that holds so many of Gordon's treasures. So light represents knowledge, and they're, they're lighting a little candle for everyone in the family, Anne and Dave and Nancy and Matt and Ben. And this table again holds his beautiful, well-used and loved fishing gear, and so many things made of wood that were made so loving. The bookends, the, the lamps, little cars. He taught Dave all of these things about working with wood. And so by lighting these candles, we dedicate this time and space to every beautiful and precious memory that you have in the form of life. was extremely proud of them. You know, I've found that one of the very best ways to honor someone at the end of their days is to simply give time and space to their story. And that's how I plan to honor this very special man. So thank you for being here with us as we give Gordon a very precious gift. It's the gift of our time. So to show love and honor and respect for the patriarch of this family, we give Gordon the gift of our sacred time today to reflect upon his story. Gordon Richard Dryden was born on July 17, 1932, in Dow City, Iowa, to Richard and Marie Mathis Dryden. He was their firstborn, their only son, and followed by two sisters, Dolores and Kara Lee, who both are living and are unable to be here today. This was a traditional, hardworking family who I imagined ate meals together around a table. They learned to work, they learned to contribute, and they learned the, fa the value of family and loyalty back in those days. 
Let me tell you a little bit where Gordon comes from. His dad, Richard, man from Dow City, Iowa. Maybe some of you know him, knew him. He was described as a hardworking man's man. Ann and Dave remembered that Richard, grandfather, had been on his own since the age of 13. He'd grown up under harsh circumstances, so he was a very strong-willed, independent man. He made his living operating heavy equipment, and they told me he participated in the construction of many of the area's state highways and roadways that are still existing today. Anne recalled Richard Dryden as extremely reserved when she met him, but she knew that he had raised up a good family and he had worked hard in life. Marie Mathis, Gordon's mother, was a lady from Iowa, also reserved, Anne told me, a homemaker who is a competent homemaker and mother, cook, outstanding cook, Anne said. She raised her, her kids, her family, in a tiny little home like we used to back then, and she made do with whatever she had. Gordon loved his mother, and Marie was remembered with love when we spoke of her. Times were simple back then. Money was hard to come by for most everybody. Gordon remembered working as a kid probably as early as he possibly could. He worked two paper routes as a little boy. Ann told me that as she spoke to him when she met him that he told her, I didn't have a car back then. So he walked all over town to make sure that the community got their two morning papers. He went to the local schools and Ann told me that he ran into some bullies early on when he was a little boy. And she told him his dad told him not to come home until he had defended himself. You remember those days? Some of you do. Yeah. So Gordon did. And again, dads were like that back then. It was to make your son tough so he could make his way in the world. Gordon graduated from Dow City High School in 1950, and he was drafted into the U.S. Army. He loved cars. From the time he could even walk around, he loved cars. He loved everything about them, especially driving them. When he was stationed at White Sands, New Mexico, as a young soldier, Anne told me he drove home every week, every weekend. So he had a lot of practice back then, driving back and forth on those highways. He was happy to be a civilian again. He wasn't crazy about the U.S. Army, but he was a good soldier, honorably discharged. And when he was done, he went to Denison, Iowa, and worked for a large, very successful retail chain called Gamble's back there. He was in Denison when one evening he spotted a very lovely girl coming out of a theater one night. And you know what? Well, her name was Ann Nicholas. And when Gordon Dryden saw her, he said to himself, that's the girl for me. And I'm going to marry that girl someday. So, they got to know one another. Anne discovered that Gordon was a good man, and a connection was made. Gordon knew a th good thing when he saw it, had a good eye. Anne told me that her family loved Gordon Dryden, and that he was at her family home one day when he came into the kitchen, and he said to Anne, get your hands out of that dishwater and come with me. So Anne told me that her, his family, her family was in on the secret. And as she and Gordon moved to the back of the house, her whole family moved with them, 
hoping to be a part of this big moment, as they knew what was going to happen. Finally, Gordon turned around and said, do you think we could be alone for a minute? <laughs> he asked his, his in-laws to be very tentatively, and Gordon presented her with the biggest diamond he could afford. That's what Anne wanted. And then she told me, it was big. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they were married on June 7th, 1956, at the Presbyterian Church in Dow City, Iowa. Attended by the entire congregation, about 300 people, Anne told me we knew everybody. Nice, tight community. They made a good pair, and they had complementary personalities. They had all the things in common that, were, that you needed, mainly financial responsibility. And Anne told me several times, you know, we were both raised in simple and humble circumstances, so we were, we were good with money. We knew that you couldn't spend like crazy. And Anne said, you know, for example, I got my wedding dress on sale, but not the shoes. <laughs> and I understand, understood completely. <laughs> she told me she was outgoing. She said, I belonged to Sweet Adeline's for many, many years. I don't know if you've heard Sweet Adeline's, but there's nothing sweeter. And Gordon supported it. She told me he never, never complained about my being at practice every single Tuesday night. She said, until I, I finally retired. And he said, great, now we can go out to dinner on Tuesdays. <laughs> Anne told me back then her dad, Herbert Nicholas, was a woodworker. And he offered to teach Gordon. And he was delighted. He was a diligent student. He was always diligent with everything he did. And a whole new hobby opened up for a perfectionist like Gordon Dryden. Everything he made was perfect. Anne and Dave almost said in unison. And then they, um, they said in unison, or pretty close. Mm -hmm. Gordon loved being productive. He loved his shop. He loved being in his garage. He loved tinkering around in his happy place. He wasn't a couch potato until he had to be, where he enjoyed shows like American Pickers and Pawn Stars. But he was excellent with his hands. He loved working with his hands, whether on cars or creating with wood. Gordon decided to head west to Boulder, Colorado, to work for the Gamble store here. He was young, hardworking, optimistic when he moved Anne out here in the early 60s. Anne said everybody at home thought we'd be back. She said, we had no intention of returning to Iowa where snow is on the ground 365 days a year, or something to that effect. <laughs> they came here to Boulder, and it was right after all the students moved in, so they had trouble finding a, a nice apartment, but finally found a two-bedroom apartment. They were positive, hardworking. After leaving Gambles, Gordon began working for public service here in Boulder. He worked in the dispatch department and then he would move eventually to the electrical engineering department and retire from there 30 years later. Anne told me that, her husband, that she was proud that Gordon always had a really good job. She told me public service was a wonderful company. It's XL Energy now, but back then it was a wonderful kind of community company. She told me that she had wonderful memories of their annual Christmas party, and I could see Anne and Gordon in black tie for those sorts of events back then. They'd take their picture, and it was lovely. It was 1968, just before their wedding anniversary in June, when David Scott Dryden was born. 
Anne told me that Gordon was delighted to have a son. And see, he, he only wanted one, one son because he had a vision for his son, Anne told me, almost from the very beginning. He said he wanted his son to have everything that he had been denied because of the simple times and financial restraints in which Gordon was raised. Scouting, camping, band, everything a boy might want and need and more. David got that, got that, got the support of his dad and his teaching his tender little clumsy fingers how to work with wood. David to Dave told me that he, he admitted to me that his dad would get frustrated at, as a perfectionist to his a clumsy kid, you know, not being perfect. Sometimes dad would get a teeny bit frustrated. But Gordon was loving, supportive, and extremely proud of everything that Dave accomplished, especially proud of his good grades and the value of education that was espoused in the family. Dave told me that he remembered fishing with his grandpa, his grandpa Richard, many, many years ago. And we remember, Matt and Ben, we remember the things that our grandpas tell us. So know that. Because your dad remembered his grandpa saying, get a good education, because no one can take that away. And Dave never forgot that tender advice. They laughed, recalling the many camping trips when Dave was a kid, the tent trailer with the beds that Ann didn't like one little bit, but she was game, she did it. Gordon loved Colorado. He loved the serenity of nature. A Sunday drive west with Ann and Dave was a perfect day. He was a good, safe driver, and he stressed safety when Dave got his license. Dave attended Boulder High School here in town, and Ann and Gordon were there in support of the high school band, and that's where the popcorn comes from. Dave was in charge of the popcorn for all of the benefits for the band. Gordon believed in giving back, and he did so whenever he could. Speaking of giving, Gordon worked double shifts during Dave's four years at the University of Colorado, and Dave graduated without owing a penny on his education. And they said Dad was proud of that, and he should be. That's a wonderful gift. He was so financially responsible that when he was 50 years old, he paid off the family home. He loved his home. Ann told me he added to the inside, he added to the outside as the years went by. His yard was immaculate and the envy of the entire neighborhood. He'd restored a Ford Model T, a 1975 Hearst Oldsmobile. There's a white model of it. That's a hot rod, Ann told me. I didn't know what it looked like, but she knew. She said he loved Oldsmobiles. And he was so mad when they went out of business. He loved a cup of coffee in the morning, and he loved a cold A&W root beer, probably in the summertime or maybe all the time. He liked having a kitty cat around to pet, and he liked puttering around his shop or his garage. He and Ann went to the Boulder First Presbyterian Church for many years. It was a wonderful comfort for them on Sunday mornings, and Anne was real sorry that we couldn't do the service in the church for Gordon. Gordon was ecstatic when Dave married Nancy and grandkids came along. Nancy Matchka told me that when she first met Gordon and Anne, they all had gone out to dinner together. She told me Gordon was cordial. He was friendly, quiet. She said he had old school manners. And she said, I realized where my husband's manners came from. She, was, she said he was an open-your-door kind of man. 
One year, he decided he was going to make Nancy a gift of a jewelry box, and it's right up there on the right. She told me that's how he showed love. He wasn't a touchy-feely guy, but he showed love by giving you something that he had created with his hands. Nancy said, he asked me what kind of wood I wanted. I don't know. Pick one. What kind of interior? What color? She said, I want it green. And what kind of corners do you want on it? Yeah. He wanted it to be to her specifications, very, very tenderly. Again, that's how he showed love. She said, we have something that he's made for us in every single room in our home. I talked to the grandsons. Matt told me he remembers Grandpa driving him around in the Oldsmobile Aurora. Matt learned to appreciate the unique qualities of the Oldsmobile Aurora. He said, I, I never saw one on the road except ours. Grandpa was particular. I said, did he let you eat fast food in the car? Oh, no. No food in the car. Matt said he was a man of few words. He was pretty serious most of the time. But then he said, as others had told me, you didn't need words with Grandpa. Ben remembered when he and Matt would visit Grandpa would light up. He could tell he was happy. He added that whenever Grandpa did say something, it was sincere. It was genuine. He didn't jibber-jabber. He said something from the heart. Mom busted you, Ben. She said, Ben's a hugger. And he used to just love hugging Grandpa around his belly. Grandpa loved it, too. I know that. Gordon was most proud of this family. He was so proud that Dave had been a good son, had never disappointed. I imagine he's proud that Dave is a good family man who raised up good, raised up good boys, supports and loves his family and his wife. Dave said with a laugh, he was proud that I could come over and fix his computer at the drop of a hat. And Anne chuckled from the background. Mm -hmm. I imagined he was proud of that long and fruitful partnership and marriage to Anne, Nicholas, and all they had meant to one another over these years. I imagined he was proud of the work he had done, the perfection he had pursued in both hobbies and as an engineer, if it's not perfect, it's not done. Gordon was proud of his home. He was proud that he'd been able to pay it off. He was proud that it was well loved and cared for. I know that he was proud that he had come from humble beginnings, that he had sacrificed, he had worked two jobs or two shifts when he had to. He had been financially successful, and as a result, he had made a good home and a good life for the people he loved the most. Family told me they learned some valuable lessons during their time with Gordon. Anne told me that she learned of an optimistic man who was never wavered in his support or his dedication to family. He was a man of, of faith who believed in and espoused Christian values. Dave told me he learned important things, valuable lessons, like measure two or three times and cut once. Or you can always cut some off, but you can't put any back. Dave said he taught me to drive safely. He taught me to gear down in slick situations. He taught Dave lots of practical advice that I know is going to come back over and over again as the years unfold. Matthew told me that he's particular. I said, is there anything that you're like, Grandpa? And he said, I'm particular about my clothes. 
And, and Anne had told me, I've been buying those boys' clothes all of their lives. And somebody said it was hit or miss, but she tried. Nancy learned that you can show love in a lot of different ways. You don't have to necessarily be touchy-feely to let people know that you're loved, that they love you. Again, Gordon showed his love and his actions and the work of his hands. For these reasons and so many more, we were not prepared to lose a man such as Gordon Richard Dryden. And just as he had been strong and steady for his loved ones all of his life, they were there for him when he needed them most. Anne told me that she's been very protective these last months, making sure he was safe in the shop, being gentle, respectful. No one was prepared to say farewell when he left us on February 21st of this year. We don't know how to navigate this life without the patriarch of the family, but here is of what we are certain. We know that his legacy of love and family is secure. We know that he did good works, and many of them will survive him. And we know that God was there for him when he entered heaven. And his God, very well pleased. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in all of the small things. And now you have dominion over the bigger things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Amen. You know, even though we won't see Gordon again face to face, he leaves the very best of himself to us in the form of his legacy. How can we ever forget that rock-solid work ethic, his curious mind, his talented hands, or his support and encouragement of those he loved? We will evermore recall Gordon when we stay active and interested, when we are amidst those that we love and we show it or not, or when we find appreciation in the simple things of this life, like maybe a, a unique car, the smell of sawdust, or when we take the time to think and measure twice and cut once. Please hold Gordon particularly close to your heart and mind as I commend him to this new life that he lives in eternity. I know some of you have felt his presence ever since his spirit left this earth. And as sure as we're sitting here, he's with us in spirit. And he knows our intentions to honor him and bless him on his way. So I easily address him. Gordon Richard, your friends and family are extremely grateful for your generosity of spirit all you gave. It's very difficult for us to let you go today, but we know we must. So today we willingly give you this gift of releasing you to your final rest. In honor of your life here with us, Lord, we wish you eternal peace and we thank you for the time that you gave us. We will remember you in the simple moments of this life we will remember you in the life lessons that we carry forward, and we will especially remember you during the dark times of our lives. And we need your strength and your resilience in order to face our own life challenges. I'd like to close our time in the Lord's Prayer. You're welcome to join along with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, 
forever and ever. Amen. And now as you go forward from today, may your hearts recall more and more reasons to be thankful that Gordon Dryden shared this journey with you. There's much to be grateful for in these memories and in knowing that he's with loved ones in heaven and surely at peace. Your best way to honor him is to build on his legacy. Put into practice something that you have come to value as a result of his life. Do we have some words? Beautiful. We have some tributes and they always add to this. Dave? And feel free to speak without your mask. Can you do it? I, I can speak loud enough. All so right. I'll, I'll just go ahead and do that. Perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm not a public speaker, so All right, I'd, I'd rather not go up. All right. Too far. So, Perfect. So this is my tribute to Gordon Brown. My third, excuse me, my first thoughts of my father are, are at our house on Edgewood Drive. My dad always seemed to be working, so I remember being at home with mom at the house often. I can specifically remember one Christmas where we received, where I received, a plastic Jaguar XJ Coupe out of here. I did not be part with the Jaguar that evening, so they had to put me in bed uh, in my crib with the car. I also remember a driving tradition that, that could have started that year. Uh, we would line up all the Christmas presents everyone had received on the living room sofa and then take a picture. This happened for many, many years to come. Uh, my father was always a busy, busy man between work and his other hobbies of woodworking, cars, house maintenance, fishing, hunting for antiques, and other honeydews that my mom had planned. There were some times when he'd have to work a double shift at work because someone would call in sick. At this time, my father worked in public service, which many of you know now is accelerated energy. I would sometimes not see him for a day at a time. When he did have time, I can remember watching many of the old 70s and 80s television shows at night with mom and him. In the same, excuse me, in the 1970s, it was Lawrence Welk, Hee Haw, Love American Style, Carol Burnett Show, Sonny and Cher, The Wonderful World of Disney. These shows eventually evolved into the 1980s sitcoms, action shows, and primetime soap operas of The Love Boat, Fantasy Island, Simon and Simon, Magnum P.I., Riptide, Falcon Crest, Knott's Landing, and of course the big one, Dallas. <laughs> Dad would often make oil popped popcorn, not the, not the crummy uh, air pop stuff and make it extremely salty. That was some of the best popcorn ever. <laughs> I would lie down on the floor either on top of him or rest right next to him and we'd watch the shows with mom. Dad was always supportive in all my jobs and job opportunities and the choices I made in life. He was proud of the fact that I had completed a bachelor's degree in college as none of my ancestors, the Dryden side, had received a college education. Dad always seemed, or excuse me, Dad was always wanting to build or fix things for me and others. From the slideshow uh, on the website, or you can see it later during the uh, luncheon, um, you'll see many of the things that he made and built for me or my other family members. There are many other projects that Gordon completed around their house in Boulder. He also served our country in the Korean War. He worked on Nike missiles at the White Sands military base in New Mexico. As you may also see in the slideshow, there was an honorary tribute brick created in his honor at the Tribute Garden in Westminster, Colorado. Father, you will be missed. I love you. to say something. I always want to give people that opportunity. Please. Whatever you want, sweetie. But know that know that he's videotaping. So maybe very good. Thank you. Okay, this is from my dad. Who couldn't be here today. So and who's your dad? Stan. And he is Anne's brother. This is long. You know my dad. Long winded. Okay. 
<clears throat> to all of Gordon and Ann's friends and extended family, thank you all for being here today to celebrate his 88 years of life. Susie and I would love to have been here, but had a trip planned several months ago. Special blessings to Dave, Nancy, Benjamin, and Matthew. But here we are celebrating the next phase in life that was depicted in a movie from the time of Anne and Gordon's wedding, From Here to Eternity, which reminds me of a day some 63 years past when Gordon and Anne left for their honeymoon in his fairly new 57 Delta Olds. It had to be an Oldsmobile or it wasn't worth having. I clearly remember when they exited the church how pissed Gordon was <laughs> when he saw the tin cans, streamers, and painted messages, one which read, from here to maternity. <laughs> His cars were always pristine, waxed, and immaculate, no windshield bugs, no scraps of paper on his floorboards, and no fingerprints from unruly children on his windows or dashboard. You will later today see a picture of Annie Gordon in front of his most prized possession, a 1950 Cornhusker Red Fast Back Rocket 88 Volts. <clears throat> Both are dressed in Cornhusker Red clothing to match the car. Pretty amazing in light of their significant distaste for the Nebraska Cornhuskers. <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost as much as my own. My best memories of those early days was Gordon's love for hot cars and drag racing, some sanctioned in both Des Moines and Omaha drag strips. But far more were of the illegal variety on country roads around Dow City, Iowa, and straightaways in Denison. Gordon knew all of the body language while cruising Maine that suggested you wanted to take someone off. <laughs> Gordon had one particular nemesis named Hank Vines. Is that right, Vines? And they would cruise around to the haunts for hot rodders until they found each other and then go at it. <laughs> I hate to say it, but I think Henry had the edge on the scoreboard, but Gordon had an official race against him later in Des Moines. We were his pit crew, so we got to ride along to the race. The two of them ended up in the same category, D stock, and went at it. The cars were the very early versions of muscle cars with V8 engines. During the final race of the day, uh, where both cars had dispatched competitors in the stages leading up to the finals. Henry versus Gordon. Gordon's Red Rocket 88 beat him by a nose. I recall after the race how Gordon claimed that he won in spite of the glowing one cylinder during the race. <clears throat> Gordon always drove with his right foot on the gas and left on the brake to practice the same move when racing, accelerating with your foot on the brake to get that big boost. To this day, I still drive the same way, totally out of habit, no racing in mind. <laughs> if you ever had a chance to ride with Gordon, you would be aware of some of his pet peeves by how he verbalized them as we rode along. <laughs> when at a stop sign, he would always claim, it seems like every damn car in Boulder passes by before I can go. <laughs> he had a particular distaste, distaste for VW Beetles, of which both Susie and I own. <laughs> he would say about them, they are so damn noisy, they sound like a garbage can filled with tin cans being shaken. <laughs> he was born at the right time, before the advent of car seats for kids with water holders and eating trays. He would have hated to lock them in, as most of our generation hates to do, and he would have enclosed them in a plastic bubble to capture the crumbs and spills. <laughs> Gordon was a craftsman. He could repair just about anything around the home or cars, and he was a master wood craftsman with a garage full of wonderful tools for his craft. He made beautiful gifts for many of us here. Toy boxes, jewelry chests, wine racks, shelves, and other items. Of those he made for Susie and me and for our girls' families, they are still in use. Totally functional and a pleasing reminder of his grace and generosity. He supplanted his verbal grace with a handcrafted version. Gordon, we will miss you. Tell all of those who went before us hello until the day when we can regather and maybe do another race with Henry Hines if he made it. <laughs> Big love to all the family that can't be here today. Thank you. Please come forward. I'll just stay yeah, here. sure. <laughs> sure. Um, I am Nan's youngest sister, and Gordon and I have a great relationship 
from the first time that we met. Um, he became my, my best friend when I was like 12, I think. And Anne didn't like scary movies, didn't want to stay up late, but at the time, Gordon and I loved scary movies. I don't like them now as an adult, <laughs> but back then, and we would stay up really, really late. And I mean, you know, Anne would go to bed. She said, I'm tired and I have to go to work or whatever she was going to do. And Gordon and I would stay up and watch these movies. <laughs> and I would be so scared to go to bed. <laughs> My dad was upstairs in a, in a two story house and creepy, creepy stairs, creepy closets, you know. <laughs> But anyway, we continued to do that for as long as he was around and we were still in, in Denison. And then when we moved to, to Boulder, um, and Gordon, I think, followed like a year later or two years later. Not that long. No. no. Six months? Yeah. 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 As, as long as we could spam. <laughs> we all sort of had that same feeling about um, having lived in Iowa. We're so glad that we lived in Iowa. <laughs> now we're in Colorado we love it. But I have a couple of things that, other than the movies, that um, I remember Gordon, when I turned 16, or maybe 15 and a half, or whenever you get your learner's permit, um, our family did not have a standard transmission car. We had all automatics. And Gordon said, well, you can't, you can't just not know how to drive a standard transmission. He said, what do you mean? Oh, I guess I could take this off. <laughs> <laughs> My husband's here, I'll read on him. <laughs> but anyway, whoops. Um, <laughs> Mike, am I doing something wrong? Oh, I know. <laughs> um, anyway, he said, you, you have to learn how to drive a standard. He said, you never know when you're going to be in a situation where you might be the only person that can help with an accident or if something goes wrong, you just have to know how to drive a standard. And I said, okay, okay. And we were still really good friends. And I said, I, I just don't think I'm gonna be able to do this. And he said, just be, just be calm. I can teach you how to do this. And at the time, he had a little, <coughs> an orange Renault, little orange Renault, which is like a really tiny, well, maybe you know what a Renault looks like, but it's just a very small car. And I remember exactly where we went. We went out on Belmont and 60, I don't know, what is that going to be there? Over by the sand pit or gravel people, whatever. Um, Belmont's, I don't know, 63rd? Yeah, 63rd. And at the time, it was a dirt road. And for that matter, at the time, 30th Street was a dirt road, and we lived in Boulder. And so he took me out there and he said, just, just be calm, I can show you how to do this. So he showed, he was picking up, he was driving, he showed me the gears and that, you know, the reflection brake and the gas and the whole thing. <laughs> so I started a couple of times, and we'd kill the engine every time. And he would say, okay, just this time, just kind of ease off on the clutch and just a little bit of gas. <laughs> and I tried, I tried 18 times <laughs> before I actually got the synchronization. And I just kept saying every time, oh, this is okay, Gordon, I'll, I'll learn later. He goes, no, we're going to learn today. <laughs> and in his nicest, you know, soft, calm voice, I was so embarrassed. But after the 18th time, I got it and I couldn't believe I got it. I was like, oh, yeah, I got it. <laughs> So from then on, I could drive a standard transmission. And then I have to tell you another thing that um, everybody in our family has hoped for a piece of wooden furniture or chests or whatever from, from Gordon. And it was sort of an honor to get one. And everybody was kind of like, you know, oh, it's my turn, it's my turn. So I got a, a jewelry box from Gordon. It's the one that's, that's closest to the casket. And um, when he gave it to me, I couldn't believe how perfect it was. I mean, it's so smooth. And it didn't make any difference if he made something and covered it with paint at the end. He sanded it, painted it, sanded it, painted it, until it would just feel like glass. And um, he wouldn't give up until it was perfect. 
And <laughs> you can feel my jewelry chest if you want. It's still perfect, but it's amazing. I think it has like nine drawers in there, eight or nine drawers, little, little tiny drawers, and each one is perfect. And so um, Nicole was my, my youngest daughter. Heather's here, my oldest daughter. Nicole is in California, and she said, make sure I give Anne an extra hug today. And she was really sad that she you know, couldn't come. But when it was her turn, she said, well, I want um, a, a toy chest for Gunnar, my grandson. And at the time, I think he was only maybe two or something, two or three. Or maybe, I don't remember. But anyway, so he said, well, what style do you want? She said, I have no idea. What kind of wood do you want? I have no idea. <laughs> so she said she saw a picture in a catalog or something, ripped it out and sent it to Gordon for the outside, you know, what she wanted the outside to look like. And he made it, like, perfect. I mean, it was just like, you could go and buy it probably at Ethan Allen. <laughs> Most of their furniture was from Ethan Allen and anything that Gordon made you know, looked exactly like it. There's a little um, box up there. It's got the, that finial top, you know, it's kind of curvy and has a finial. Well, they have a, a larger one in their uh, living room in Boulder, and Anne has a lot of her little figurines and things in there. But it's just, I mean, you can't, it's, it's craftsmanship, it's just, it's, it's art. You know, it's, it's woodworking art. And so anyway, Nicole wanted <laughs> this chest. And so he made it, and then one time when they came home, um, we could go back and work so when it, when it was finished, she came to Boulder for a visit. We, two guys put this chest, you know, it's, it's big, it's you know, like a, sort of like a um, hope chest size, you know, or, and I visit it Cedar Barn? I don't even remember. Anyway, so it was perfect, and she couldn't wait to get it. Came home, took two people to put it in the back of her. SUV, so she could take it back to California. And not too many years after that, um, there were nine forest fires in the Colorado area at the time. Mm -hmm. Where is Colorado? And the California area. <laughs> Just a senior home letter. Um, anyway, so when she got it to California, you know, some people had to help her get it off, get it into the house. So, long story long, during the fires, there was her, her uh, Gunner's toy box was in the house with toys and whatever in it, and one of the fires got within, I think, four blocks of their house, and the police said, went through the neighborhood and said, get out now. Don't take anything, just get out now. And she lived on this big hill where there were uh, two lanes of traffic going up and two lanes going down, and they made them all four lanes going out to get them out of the neighborhood fast enough. And the only thing that Nicole took with her was the toy box. <laughs> and she went in the house, got it herself, and it was full of stuff, and carried it to the car and put it in. It was just like, you know, I've grown much, but that was the only thing that she felt like it was important enough to take with her. So anyway, <laughs> and then Heather ended up getting a jewelry box some, some time later, and she's got hers. And mine's on the left end, but there's uh, two pictures over there on the right-hand side that shows um, Heather's jewelry box and Nicole's toy chest. They're kind of falling off to the side, but anyway. Um, but anyway, I just want to thank Gordon, thank you, Gordon, for all that you did for all of us. I mean, it was, it was crazy. Everybody wanted a piece of his furniture. And I think that most of the um, uh, sister-in-laws that stuff and their children. So you can ask all of us, <laughs> what did you get? Did you get? And I think, Kelly, you got a toy box that was painted that was like wax, right? Yeah. Maddie got a toy box that was just pristine, beautiful white. Yeah. And she used it for a still yeah. And I think there, someone said that there's a picture of Maddie inside her toy box. Yeah, it's in the slideshow. It's the yeah, slideshow. Yeah. So, anyway, we're going to make you Gordon. <laughs> Thank you.
very much. That always adds to our experience here today. And please, uh, later on, admire these beautiful things. Uh, my hope is that, that all of those things that you have, that Gordon made for you, I hope that every time you pick them up, every time you see them, that he comes back to you in warm and happy memory. Speaking of uh, symbols, we've prepared a little symbol for you. Everyone, please feel free to take one of these little tassels. Uh, we're giving them to you as a little symbol of our time here together today, as well as the craftsmanship of, of, of a woodworker and uh, Gordon's appreciation of the simple pleasures of this life. So thank you very much. We're going to make our way across to the cemetery where we will have military honors from the U.S. Army. They're waiting for us there. And I will give the mic over to Alejandro to give you good direction. <laughs>